Section 5 of The Grizzly, Our Greatest Wild Animal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kyra Jennings. The Grizzly, Our Greatest Wild Animal by Enos A. Mills. A Long Winter's Sleep. When the food of the grizzly bear becomes scarce, he goes to bed and sleeps until a reasonable supply is available, even though he waits five months for it. He feasts on the fullness of the land during the summer and wraps himself in a thick blanket of fat. When winter comes on, he digs a hole and crawls in. This layer of fat is a non-conductor of cold and in due time is drawn on for food. One autumn day, I visited the Hallett Glacier with a professor from the University of Chicago. After exploring one of the upper crevices, we stood looking down the steep slope of the glacier. New snow had fallen a few days before, and a soft slushy coating still overlaid the ice. The professor challenged me to coast down the steep snow-lubricated ice slope. We seated ourselves on this soft, slippery snow, and he gave the word, Go! Just as we slid away, we saw at the bottom of the slope, where we were soon to be, a huge grizzly bear. I wish you might have seen our efforts as we tried to change our minds on that steep slope. The grizzly was busily eating grasshoppers, but he heard us coming and fled at a racing gallop, giving an excellent exhibition of his clumsy hind legs reaching out flat-footed. Each autumn, numbers of insects and sometimes bushels of grasshoppers either are blown upon the ice and snow or else approach it too closely and fall from having their wings chilled. Evidently, the grizzlies long ago learned of this food supply, for the ice fields are regularly visited by them during the autumn. Along the timber line, the grizzly feeds freely upon the last of autumn's berries and the last green plants. Many a grizzly goes to the heights to put on fat for his long winter's sleep. Bear food becomes scarce as winter approaches. Fruit, berries, grass, and weeds are out of season. Most birds and insects are gone. The bear feeds on what remains. Small animals, which he digs out, a stray stranded fish, now and then a dead bird or animal carcass, the red fruit of the rose, and the nuts, bark, and roots of trees and plants. I do not believe the grizzly eats a special or purgative food during the few days preceding his denning up, although he may do so. On the few occasions when I have been able to keep track of a bear during the four or five days immediately preceding his retirement, he did not eat a single thing. I have examined a number of grizzlies that were killed while hibernating, and in every instance the stomach and intestines were empty. These facts lead me to conclude that bears rest and fast for a few days before going permanently to the winter den. The bear generally prepares his winter quarters in advance of the time needed. He may occasionally sleep in his den before taking possession of it for the winter, but this is exceptional. In two cases that I know of, he lay outside the den, though near it, and another of other times he kept away from the den until he entered it for the long sleep. After the den is completely ready, the grizzly continues his usual search for food. Generally, this requires long excursions, and he may wander miles from the den. In climbing along the bottom of a deep, narrow ravine one November day, I saw on the slope above me what appeared to be a carload or more of freshly dumped earth. My first thought was that a prospector was at work driving a tunnel, but upon examination, it proved to be a recently finished, but not yet occupied, hibernating den. The entrance was about three feet in diameter. Just inside the den was a trifle larger. It extended, nearly level, about twelve feet into the mountainside. At the back, it was six feet across and four feet high. The size of the den varies and is apparently determined by the character of the soil in which it is made and also by the inclination of the bear making it. Most other dens measured were smaller than this one. The grizzly may use the same den for several winters or have a new one each year. He may dig the den himself or take an old one that some other bear has used or he may make use of one shaped by nature, a cave or a rock slide. I knew of one grizzly hibernating in a prospector's abandoned tunnel. Sometimes, like the black bear, he will dig a den on a steep mountainside beneath the wildly spreading roots of trees, sometimes beneath a large fallen log, 
close to the upturned roots which support it. In crossing the mountains one February, I noticed a steamy vapor rising from a hole in the snow by the protruding roots of an overturned tree. I walked to the hole to investigate. The vapor was rank with the odor of a bear. Near my home, on the slope of Long's Peak, I have known grizzlies to den up beneath the snow-crushed, matted tree growths at the timberline, at an altitude of about 11,000 feet. Twice I have known bears to hibernate in enormous nests that were made of long fibers of cedar bark. It must have taken days to construct one of these nests as more than 40 cedar trees had been more or less disrobed to supply material for it. It resembled the nests of trash that razorback hogs in the south construct, though much larger. The bear, after piling it up, worked his way in near the bottom, somewhat after the fashion of a boy crawling into a haycock. Over this hibernating nest, the snow spread its blanket and probably afforded all the protection needed. Sometimes the entrance to a den is partly closed by the occupant, once in, he reaches out and claws the lower part full of earth or rakes in trash and leaves. In most instances, nothing is done to close the entrance. The snows drift back into the den, pile upward, and at last close the entrance most effectually. All the dens that I recall were upon northerly or easterly, the cooler slopes. The snow as it fell would be likely to remain and close or blanket the entrance all winter long. Snow evidently enters into the grizzly's winter plans. Late one cold, snowless December, I came upon a grizzly carrying spruce boughs into his den. Evidently, he had used the den and found it cold. The den had a large opening. This he may have been intending to close. The rocky floor was already piled a foot deep with boughs. I have seen two other dens with floor coverings. One of these was of pine twigs, and the other of coarse grass and kinnikinnick. But in most cases, the bear sleeps upon the uncovered rocks or the naked earth. Snow is a factor in determining when a bear begins his winter sleep. If he is fat and food is scarce, an early, heavy snow is pretty certain to cause him to turn in early. If no snow comes and food is still to be had, the bear is likely to delay his hibernation. The individual inclination of the bear and his condition, whether fat or thin, are also factors which influence his time of retiring. I knew of two bears, apparently of similar condition, one of whom turned in three weeks earlier than the other. Two bears whom I noticed one winter ran about more than a month after all the other bears had disappeared. Both were thin, just why I should like to know. They also turned in shortly after they became rounded out. Generally, bears of a locality turn in for winter at about the same time. Hibernating may begin early in November, but in most localities, and in most years, the time is likely to be a month later. In Alaska and the Northwest, many bears hibernate in the heights above the timberline. I have found a number in the mountains of Colorado, with winter quarters at an altitude of 12,000 feet. In southern Colorado and in the Yellowstone Park region, Many have denned up at about the altitude of 6,000 feet, but a grizzly may hibernate anywhere in his territory where he can find or make a den to his liking. Except when there are cubs, a grizzly dens alone. Accounts which tell a number of full-grown grizzlies spending the winter in one den lack verification. The cubs are born in the hibernating den, and they den up with the mother the first and sometimes the second winter after their birth. The cubs generally den up together the first winter after they are weaned. Once in for the winter, the bear is likely to stay in the den for weeks. Most of the time probably is spent sleeping, and so far is known, without either food or water. A bear may be routed out of his winter quarters without difficulty. Generally, his sleep is not heavy enough greatly to deaden his senses. Hunters, trappers, floods, and snowslides have driven grizzlies from their dens during every stage of hibernation, and in each case, a moment after the bear came forth, his senses were as alert as ever. He was able either to run away or to fight in his normal manner. Prospectors in Jefferson Valley, Montana told me of staking claims and starting to drive a tunnel early one December. A day or two after they began blasting, they saw a bear break out of a snowy den and scamper away on the mountainside. They tracked him to the place where he had holed up again. It was their belief that the noise or the jar of their shots had awakened and reawakened the bear, until, disgusted, he left the region for a quieter sleeping place. A sniffling and grunting attracted my attention one midwinter day as I was snowshoeing along the side of a ravine. 
Presently, a short distance ahead of me, I saw a grizzly's nose thrust out of a hole in the snowy slope. Then his head followed. Sleepily, the grizzly half opened his eyes, then closed them again. His shaking and drooping head fell lower and lower, until with a jerk he raised it only to let it droop again. He repeated this performance a number of times. Evidently, it was the head of a very sleepy grizzly. Occasionally, he opened his eyes for a moment, but he did not seem interested in the outside world, and he finally withdrew his head and disappeared in the den. After midwinter, and especially towards the spring, a bear sometimes comes out for fresh air and exercise, or to sun himself. One gray February day, snowshoeing along the Big South Pudra, I chanced to look across an opening into the edge of the woods and saw a grizzly walking round and round in a well-beaten pathway in the snow. Occasionally, he reared up, faced about, and walked round in the opposite direction. His den was nearby. Half a mile farther on, I came upon a bear trail near the entrance to another den. Here, the bear had walked back and forth in a pathway that was about 60 feet long. It was beaten down in the snow to a depth of 15 inches. Two places showed that the bear had rolled and wallowed about in the snow. Elsewhere, another year, about the middle of March, I examined much-worn pathways near a grizzly's den. These had been made at least three weeks before and had been used a number of times. One pathway led to the base of a cliff that faced the east where the bear had probably lain in the morning sun. Another led to a much-used spot that caught the afternoon sun. Perhaps a bear sometimes becomes tired or restless during his long winter sleep. Now and then, he comes forth in spring with the fur worn off his hips, back, or shoulders. He may kill time, when through sleeping, with a short excursion outside the den. If the den is large, he sometimes tramples about like a caged animal. Climatic conditions, the altitude at which the bear hibernated, and other factors determine the time when grizzlies leave their dens. Most of them come forth during March, but stragglers may not appear until late in April. Mothers with cubs remain in the den a few weeks longer than bears without cubs. At the limits of tree growth, one cold March day, I came upon the tracks of a grizzly bear descending the mountain. I backtracked them and found the den in which the grizzly had spent the winter. The inside of the den was gravelly and comparatively clean. Only this single line of tracks led from the den, though the weather had been clear for a week, so I judged this was the first time the grizzly had sauntered forth. It was just sundown when I reached the den. The heights were icy, and I hesitated about continuing across the divide that night, so concluded to occupy the den. I knew that bears often take a short ramble in the spring, and then return to the den, but I took the chances of sharing it with him. I do not know what the grizzly did that night, whether or not he came back, but my fire in the mouth of the den may have kept him at bay. The hard, cracked skin on the soles of the grizzly's feet is shed during hibernation, and the feet in spring are soft and tender. For several days, he avoids traveling over rough places. His claws grow out during the winter rest also. When he goes to sleep, they are worn, broken, and blunt. But he comes out of winter quarters with claws long and moderately pointed. What is the grizzly's condition in the spring after months of fasting? He has hibernated from three to five months, and in this time probably has taken neither water nor food. First of all, he comes forth fat and not in the least hungry. The walls of his stomach have greatly contracted, almost completely closing the interior. Two stomachs which I saw taken from grizzlies killed early in the spring were as hard as chunks of rubber and had capacity for not more than two or three spoonfuls. But when the grizzly reappears after his long winter sleep, he is as strong as ever and can run for hours or fight with normal effectiveness. He may not eat anything for a few days after leaving the den. For many days he eats lightly, and it may be two weeks before he has a normal appetite. His first food is likely to be the early, tender shoots of plants or trees, tuberous roots, swelling buds, and green grass. I once watched a grizzly for seven days after he emerged from his hibernating cave. His winter quarters were near Timberline on Battle Mountain, at an altitude of nearly 12,000 feet. The winter had been of average temperature, but with scanty snowfall. I saw him, by chance, just as he left the den, on the first day of March. He walked about aimlessly for an hour or more, then returned to his sleeping place without eating or drinking anything. The following day he wandered until afternoon before he broke his fast. He ate a mouthful of willow twigs and took a taste of water. 
He walked leisurely down the mountain and towards sundown made himself a nest at the foot of a cliff in the woods. Here he remained, apparently sleeping, until the next afternoon. Then, just before sundown, he walked out a short distance, smelled of a number of things, licked the snow a few times, and returned to his nest. The fourth day he went early for water and ate more willow twigs. In the afternoon he came upon a dead bird, apparently a junco, which he ate. After another drink he lay down at the foot of a tree for the night. The following morning he drank freely of water, surprised and devoured a rabbit, and then lay down. He slept until noon the next day, then set out foraging. He found a dead mouse and toward evening caught another rabbit. The seventh day was much like the preceding one. During the first week out, the grizzly did not eat food enough to make him one ordinary meal. Hibernation is not well understood. The habit probably originated from the scarcity for food. However, in Mexico, grizzlies sometimes hibernate even though the climate be mild and food plentiful. As these grizzlies probably came from the cold north, the habit may have been fixed in the species when it arrived. Hibernation appears to be helpful and not harmful, and it may therefore continue for ages even though not required. The rest which hibernation gives to mind and stomach, with the entire organism relaxed, may both increase efficiency and lengthen life. The polar bear has its own peculiar hibernating habits. The food of this bear is seafood. This is available even in the wintertime, on or beneath the ice. The male polar bears do not hibernate. The females do not, except when about to give birth to young. The cubs at birth are small and helpless, and require the mother's constant care and the shelter of the den for some weeks after birth. Mr. J.D. Figgins has written one of the best comments on hibernation that I have read. I quote as follows. The period of hibernation in any mammal not only varies in a given species, but is largely influenced by the available supply of food to which it is accustomed or that is necessary for its requirements. Example of this character may be cited among several species of mammals. It is the custom of the chipmunks or ground squirrels to hoard up at least a partial supply of food in the autumn for consumption during the winter months, but this is rarely, if ever, sufficient to keep these interesting little animals active for the entire period. In most localities, there is no available food with which to augment their scant store and they are never in evidence from late October to April. In other locations where the fruit of the critigus or thorn apple is to be had, they may be seen almost daily, although the ground may be covered with several feet of snow and low temperatures prevail. Another example is the possum. Ordinarily, these animals are active throughout the entire year, but towards the northern edge of the range they frequently hibernate for considerable periods, 31 days from personal observations. Certain of the small rodents can, and probably do, hoard sufficient food for actual need during the winter months, but the problem is in direct ratio to the size of the animal. Hence, we find the marmot, a much larger animal, making no provision, although his habitat is confined to the higher altitudes and his period of hibernation is extended over a greater length of time than many other species. His food consists wholly of grass and other green plants, and it is doubtful if he could subsist on dry food. Granting that he could, the amount required would be prohibitive, otherwise he would make some effort in that direction, as do the conies, a much smaller animal. Being omnivorous and of great size, a bear could not secure or preserve the necessary amount of food to carry him through five months. Such food could not consist of any variety other than vegetation, and he is not a hay eater, and so, nature has provided him a means of surviving the long periods of fasting and probably without discomfort. It is well known that bears show a distinct preference for fruit during the late summer and autumn months not because that this is the season for the various fruits, but through a need of their sugar content and its fattening qualities, composed largely of juices which are quickly absorbed, the digestive process is very brief and the discarded residue is discharged at once. This may give rise to the belief that a purgative has been employed as a means of cleansing the bowels and explains the presence of unbroken berries in the excrement and the absence of offensive odors. As a means of exploding the purgative theory, we need only refer to bears in captivity, although the latter may be confined to cement floors and have no access to any matter whatever other than the food regularly supplied. They frequently hibernate in a quite orderly manner. 
It must be conceded that bears are irregular in the period of holing up and that they do so only when food has become too scarce to sustain activities without a drain upon the store of fat they have acquired or during very severe weather. In the meantime, there has been a gradual reduction in food as the period of hibernation approaches and a consequent lessened activity of the bowels, nor is there reason for surprise because of the absence of excrement in the burrow and the presence of matter in the rectum when the bear emerges in the spring. In captivity, bears may or may not hibernate. As a rule, they sleep for more or less varying periods during severe weather. One authority states that grizzly has been known to sleep from 60 to 75 days, and during that time, it was not difficult to awaken him. Black bears frequently pass the winter without evidence of even drowsiness. Others awake at irregular intervals, and after feeding lightly, return to their slumber. The winter life of many animals is stern and strange. During the autumn, the beaver stores up a food supply for use when the pond is closed over with ice. The coney harvests hay for his winter food. Numbers of animals hunt food each day in the snow, but the woodchuck and the bear hibernate. That is, they fast and sleep in a den during the winter. End of section 5